Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. It's not just knowing about the doctrine in the Bible. That is not what we stand for here. Streaming powerful biblically based messages live down the internet. This congregation may never be gathered together again as we see it. Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. Good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. We are streaming live on the internet from London. This show is dedicated to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. On tonight's program, we will be discussing the first of a four-part series about the restoration of the family unit. We will be studying what the Bible teaches about the manhood. More about our subject after we have heard some music. Restoration of the Family Unit Part 1 Manhood We will discuss this subject tonight with answers from the Bible. Have a pen and paper ready to write down some notes. Tonight, listeners, we will be discussing these questions together. For what purpose was the man made? What masculine qualities is the gospel to restore to a man? When is a man to look for a wife? How is a man to be a husband and to care for his wife? And how is a man to help raise children to the glory of God? Before we have our study this evening, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio, streaming live on the Internet from London. Lord, as we study your word this evening, We ask your Holy Spirit to be with us and to teach us 
and to teach us those truths which will help us to be saved in your kingdom is our prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, for what purpose was a man created? We read in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We read in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, and verse 4, In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The Bible teaches us that God created man in his own image. Jesus Christ is the image of God. He is the second person of the Godhead. And so, man was created to reflect the image of Jesus Christ. But why? We read in the book of Matthew chapter 11, and verse 27, this is Jesus speaking, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. We read in the book of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Man was made in the image of Christ because Christ, the second person of the Godhead, reveals to man God the Father. This is the order that the Godhead has set up in the universe. We must understand this first, listeners, in order to understand the true purpose of our existence as men upon this earth. Now, listeners, how does the Bible describe what God is like? How was man created to be from the very beginning of his existence? This is what tonight's radio broadcast is about. So let us look further at what the Bible teaches. We read in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. We read in the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The Bible teaches us that God's image is righteousness and true holiness. This is the light that shines from God. Man was created to receive the righteousness and holiness of God through Jesus Christ the Lord. Quite simply, listeners, Man was created to reflect the light of God's love. Through Jesus Christ, man was created to receive God's love, and through God's love, rule over all the lower orders of being on this planet Earth. We read in the book of 1 John chapter 4, and verses 8 to 9, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. We read in the book of 1 John chapter 5, and verses 11 to 13, And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that have the Son have life, and he that have not the Son of God have not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Man was created to live through the Son of God. It is through creation and also through redemption that God seeks to restore his purpose of love towards us again 
through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yes, listeners, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the central being of the universe. Now, what masculine qualities is the gospel to restore to a man? We read in the book of John, chapter 5, and verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. We read in the book of Psalms, chapter 119, and verse 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Jesus has taught us that the scriptures testify of him. As man was created by Jesus Christ to reflect his righteousness and holiness, and as all that God commands men to do is righteous, we can learn from the characters of the men in the Bible who were obedient to God what true love and true manhood really is. We read in the book of Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, And in the morning, Rising up a great while before day, this is Jesus, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. We read in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 7 to 9, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Jesus shows by his example that a real man wakes up early in the morning to spend time with God in prayer. Thus we learn that to be masculine is to pray for strength to resist temptation and to be obedient to God's commandments of true love. We read in the book of Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus has taught us that a true man goes to the house of God to worship and to read the scriptures. We read in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, and verse 14, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. Jesus shows us that to be a man and masculine is to have compassion upon those who are sick and to help them to be healed. We read in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, And verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Jesus shows us that to be a man and masculine is to place God's law, judgment, mercy and faith above all other matters in this life. Jesus has taught us that these are the matters that men should put first in life in order to be men. We read in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. We also read in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Dear listening men, Christ is gentle, God is gentle. It is his gentleness, yet eternal power, that makes him so great. See Psalm 18.35 With his eternal power, he has eternal control. God is not rough in manners. He is infinitely noble. It is not roughness that makes a man, but his ability to lovingly exercise controlled power. One can only learn this character trait through the power of the Holy Ghost. 
Men, please do not pattern yourselves after Satan and the world. We as a whole are too rough. We must learn to be as refined and gentle as Jesus is. Then we can understand more about purity, holiness, and the love of God. We read in the book of Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. We read in the book of Romans chapter 2 and verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Jesus teaches us that as a man increases in his wisdom and stature, then he will increase in favour with God and man. Jesus teaches us that true masculinity is developed when men exercise what they have learned about God's law, judgment, mercy and faith practically. To be a man is not just to know what God says, but it is to do what God says concerning these matters. It is practical godliness that enables a man to be like Jesus. There are too many men that can talk well, but when it gets down to the business of doing good and taking action for good, as a man should, they are as weak as water. They have no power within themselves to do the good that they promise to others because there is sin ruling in their lives. And listeners, we have not forgotten about women. Male and female were both created to reflect Jesus. We will be looking specifically at womanhood next week. We'll have a break for some music, and then we'll carry on with this study. Some want the crowd. But they won't bear their cross Cause it takes everything To serve the Lord Some want bright mansions But they won't pay the cost Cause it takes everything To serve the Lord It takes your hands and your head and your heart. Yes, it takes you all. It takes everything to serve the Lord. It takes your time and your means and your prayers lest you fall. It takes everything to serve the Lord. Some wear his name while they still live in shame, but it takes everything to serve the Lord. They want to be seen, but they don't want to be clean, but it takes everything to serve the Lord. It takes your hands and your head and your heart. Yes, it takes you all. It takes full surrender to serve the Lord. It takes your time and your means and your prayers, lest you fall. It takes everything, everything, child. To serve the Lord. When is a man to look for a wife? We read in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We read in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, 
But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We read in the book of Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The Bible teaches four fundamental stages in life. Preparation to receive Christ. Preparation for ministry. Preparation for a life partner. And preparation to bring a life into the world. At every stage, a man is to seek Christ first for his divine counsel and guidance. A man is not to look for a wife before he has given his heart to Christ and not before he has understood his mission and calling in life in God's service. A man is also not to look for a wife until he is able to leave his father and mother and stand on his own two feet. He has to be able to prove that he can provide for himself and his own family. A man should also be careful about the wife that he chooses and should really wait for his mind to be pure before he chooses someone, because like appreciates like. If a man's mind is impure, he will only be attracted to impure women. But if a man's mind is pure in Christ, then he will only seek a wife and companion that will reflect and complement his own. Now, contrary to popular belief, there is no such thing as an alpha and beta male as a Christian. These terms were almost solely in animal ethology prior to the 1990s, particularly in regard to mating privileges with females, ability to hold territory, and hierarchy in terms of food consumption within the herd or flock. In the 1982 book of Chimpanzee Politics, Power and Sex Among Apes, primatologist and ethologist Franz de Waal suggested that his observations of a chimpanzee colony could possibly be applied to human interactions. And so to all the men listening who have been hyped up thinking that they are an alpha male, listen, you have been deceived. You are being given a name associated with the social and sexual behavior of animals, not a name that belongs to a Christian. It is a name that comes from the study of the lower order of animal creature, not a study of the creator. Listeners, Jesus was no alpha male. And to all the women listening that crave alpha males, search your hearts, as sin surely life at the door, if that is the type of man that you're looking for. But again, we are looking at womanhood next week. Masculinity is is not about how many women a man can attract and have sex with, or how many men that a man has under his control. It is rather the opposite. Masculinity is about a man's devotion and faithfulness to God, his strength to keep himself free of sexual impurity, and his willingness to love, serve, and protect his wife and family. Masculinity is not about the power to rule over others. Jesus is our example. And so men, when you have Christ-like, Christ-like, I should say, and not animal-like qualities, then you are ready to look for a wife and to have your own children. We read in the book of Matthew, chapter 20, and verses 25 to 28. Now this is Jesus speaking to his disciples But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So you see, man, what makes a man great is his willingness and his ability to serve others. Now then, how is a man to be a husband 
and to care for his wife. We read in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 to 33. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Listeners, the Bible is clear about how a husband is to care for his wife. Quite simply, as Christ loved and cared for and gave his life for his church, to keep it pure, so is a man to care for his wife. Now this is the study and practice and school of a lifetime, one of which husbands, if they want to be true men, must be willing to learn daily at the foot of the cross. Husbands often blame their wife for things, when often the problem lies within themselves. Men, even if your wife is doing something wrong, Treat her gently and be kind and do all you can to restore her in the right path. Even if you have to sacrifice your life to save your wife, did you not promise to devote yourself to her fully in your marriage vow? Now how is a man to help raise children to the glory of God? We read in the book of Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I, made, have I made thee. We read in the book of Genesis chapter 18 and verses 18 to 19. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now Abraham is recorded in scripture as being a true man and father. Why? Because a true man and father commands his children to keep the way of the Lord. This he will do in love, not with force. He has the family disciplined, doing justice and judgment, which means he will treat every single member of the family fairly and truly through the love of God. And for all modern parents listening who are following the government and not the commandments of God, having your house in, sub in subjection does at times mean administering the rod to the rear end of unruly and disobedient children. We read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 22 and verse 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. We read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23 and verses 13 to 14, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. We read in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29 and verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but the child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now here is what it means to be a man. Not to brutalize a child to death, 
but to ensure that, when necessary, stripes are given. Not in anger, but through the love of God, to drive out the foolishness that the devil seeks to place in a seriously disobedient infant. Now, if any parent listening thinks that you are better than God, or know methods better than him, woe be unto you. The lessening of the rod of correction, and please listen carefully, in love, listeners, not in anger, is one of the main evils that has caused so much violence and crime in modern society. Did you not know that Satanists and witches planned this? The Bible makes it plain. We read in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Humanists and witches, many who now call themselves feminists, plan for the governments of the world to legislate that children cannot be smacked by parents. This is because, listeners, they design for children to become rebels against the God of heaven. For more solid information about this, watch The Origin of the Aquarian Age by the late James Arabito. Parents, you will be lost if you have brought up a child slackly and caused them to become a criminal and tyrant in this world. And so to round up this evening, let us hear what Pastor Walter Pearson had to say on the topic about manhood. It's a sad situation when you put more weight on a partner in a marriage or even in a dating situation more weight that they can handle you're gonna say I want somebody to complete me who in the world can complete you the Bible says you are already complete in Christ the fact is that through daily communion with God the likeness of the divine becomes a reality within the human soul. There is nothing for this life or for eternity that man cannot receive through spiritual union with Christ. We may be complete in Christ. So tonight I have another reason to recommend Jesus to you because anything you need for now or for eternity you can find by communing with Jesus Christ. I believe that the most unattractive person in the world <laughs> is a person standing around waiting for somebody to complete you. I believe you put off radar. I believe that somebody 10 miles away could pick it up. And they know that somebody is sitting somewhere. I'm waiting on somebody to complete me. <laughs> Ladies, if you want to run a man 10 miles away, just get that thought in your mind and it will form itself on your face. It will be in your body language. And when he comes near and you begin to move towards him, You'll be able to feel it. That woman wants somebody to complete her. <laughs> and I am not the one. So the, you know how they do. It's, hi. <laughs> how you doing? And, and if there's anything more tragic than that, it's a full-grown man. <laughs> you know, talk about somebody all big and masculine and then look at you over there talking about I need somebody to complete me <laughs> every woman on the face of the earth ought to turn and run what she's looking for is somebody who's powerful you know since 9-11 every woman now is looking for a man in uniform they want a fireman they want a policeman they want somebody in the National Guard even but somebody who, who wears a uniform and looks capable so brother, if you haven't been doing this, you ought to try it. At least act like you're in charge of something. You know, hey, how you doing? Walk like you're on a mission. Don't stand around waiting for someone. Somebody complete me. 
You ought to demonstrate love constantly. Now, gentlemen, this is a time when maybe we need to talk. Because I know that, you know, some of us think that if you bring home money, and if you bring food, and if you supply things, that your wife ought to know that you love her. Well, there's something about the way women are wired. They like to kind of hear it, even though it may seem obvious to you. So look, it really won't, it won't crack your jaw, it won't hurt your throat, it will not make your teeth look worse. You can actually squeeze it out. Remember before you got married, all that stuff you used to talk? Huh? You had songs that everybody knew, but you put a little twist on them. Huh? You had poems that you thought she had never heard before, and you pretended that they might have been yours. But you always had some little sweet something to say. Now when you get married, all you got to do, mm. <laughs> got to do better than that. The things you used to do when you were trying to win each other and impress each other. Come on now, I'm not going to bother with you long, I don't have time. But you remember, uh, don't, wait a minute, honey. You in, move up just a little bit. You remember that? Uh, now, hey, what you waiting for? And, and sister, come on now, talk to me about that meal even when you had to go to your mom's place to get her to cook the thing, when you brought it home, it was yours. And you had a little candlelight, you know, and all kinds of stuff, and you had a little, you know. You, you, you got to keep on doing that. If you know the man likes a special kind of something, cook it again. Huh? And, and kinda, kinda look like you used to look when you cooked it. Because if you make every day special, the, the life you live together will be a joy. God intended husbands and wives to rejoice together. If you're walking around looking mad, you don't touch each other's hands anymore. You don't go anywhere with each other anymore. You don't find each other's company enticing. You have done something wrong. Here is what God says. In, in the days of old, you connected wells and cisterns. Got to make sure I get it right. You, consist, you connected wells and cisterns with home. But fountains and rivers were in the street. What this text actually says, are your waters scattered in the street? Are you drinking water? that runs in the street? Why would you drink water and not know what's in it? I'm trying my best to preach. Why would you drink polluted water? Why would you go in the street in some river that's flowing in a dirty street or some fountain that's public? where everybody's been drinking. Who knows who drank their last? Huh? I'm trying to preach. I don't know whether y'all got it, but I'm preaching it. When you come home, you got a well. It's covered. You can let down the bucket in your own well. Pour it into your own cistern so you know where it came from. You know what's in it. You have tasted it before. You know it's not going to hurt you. It's only going to do you good. So while other folks are thirsty, you know, it's amazing. Single people, you know, before they get married, I, I don't even want to get married. I, uh, you know, I, I'm not even interested. Yeah, but you're thirsty. Thirsty. 
In fact, sometimes your thirst drives you to do things that you never ought to have done. But here's what God says in Proverbs. He says, sister, you don't have to be thirsty anymore. I'm giving you your own well. And I'm giving you your own container, your sister. So your days of drinking in the street are over. You don't have to worry about being thirsty. All you need to do is get home. <laughs> so if you're thirsty, just hold on. Y'all ain't trying to hear me. I'm making a, an amazing parallel here. If you get thirsty in the street, don't let anybody offer you strange water. Because God is looking at your thirst and how you quench it. So sister, if God has given you a man, he may not look like he used to look. His hair may be gone. His hair may be gray. He may be bent over, but he's your well. And he got bent over by going out working to make your house a home. He got that way by bringing home what you needed to rear your children. And you ought to hold on to that man, rub his bald head and praise God for it. If that woman isn't exactly like she used to be, if she doesn't look quite in the same shape, remember that she got that way by bearing your children, by making your house a home. She got that way by taking care of you. She gave herself. She may have gone to work to make your house successful. So if she's a little bit less lovely than Madison Avenue thinks, you know who she is. And I'm telling you, when you get thirsty in the street, don't drink what's out there. Get home before you quench your thirst. Listeners, we're going to have a break some music and come back with some closing thoughts. Just the time I feel that I've been caught in the mire of self And just the time I feel my mind's been bought by worldly wealth And when the breeze begins to blow I know God's Spirit and when my worldly wanderings just melt into his love, oh, I want to know you more deep within my soul. I want to know you, oh, I want to know you to feel your heart and know your mind looking stirs up within me cries that say I want to know Looking in your eyes 
stirs up within me Cries to say I want to know Christ says, draw near to me, and I will draw near. Listeners, for our closing thoughts this evening, here is what the Spirit of God declares, what a man and a woman should aspire to. God tests and proves us by the common occurrences of life. It is the little things which reveal the chapters of the heart. It is the little attentions the numerous small incidents and simple courtesies of life that make up the sum of life's happiness. And it is the neglect of kindly, encouraging, affectionate words and the little courtesies of life which helps compose the sum of life's wretchedness. It will be found at last that the denial of self for the good and happiness of those around us constitutes a large share of the life record in heaven. Now let us think about this for a moment. God tests and proves us by the common occurrences of life. So this is how the Lord is testing us, by how we behave towards one another every day. Are we showing the little attentions in all, and are we showing simple courtesies one to another? Especially men, are you showing this towards your wife and towards your children and towards your family, towards mother and father, sister and brother, to neighbors and friends? Here is how God is testing us. See? And these are the things, listeners, I pray that as we've initially looked at this subject tonight for us to really pray about and focus upon so listeners i pray now that we can hear what god says and then as we've looked at manhood tonight i pray that as the men we would humble ourselves and be willing to love and to serve especially towards those who if we're married we've made a vow towards let us now pray to close. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, the two greatest gifts that you've given to mankind are marriage and the Sabbath. Lord, there's so many marriages that either have broken or that are strained. Lord, because we know that the enemy is trying his best to destroy the family unit. But I pray, Lord, and we know that you have power to restore all things. And I pray especially tonight, first for those couples who have been faithful over the years, one towards another. Lord, I pray and ask for your blessing to continue to be upon them. May those listening, may even renew their vows one towards another and vow to be even more loving and kind and true to each other, Lord, and may they continue to set a sterling example to society of what your grace can do in the hearts of believers. 
I pray for those who may be having struggles in their marriage, Lord, that together that they would go on their knees, Lord, and that they would look to each other and to see where they've gone wrong and how for your grace, Lord, that they can restore bonds of love together. I pray that they can put the past behind them and that they can go forward afresh, renewed in your love and power, because it's the purpose of the gospel to restore the family unit. And I pray, Lord, for those whose marriages may have failed and who may be blaming themselves even today for the wrong things that they've done. Lord, you're in the heavenly sanctuary now. You're there to give us power to restore us from evil and to cleanse and to make us happy. And Lord, for you, all things are possible. And I just pray, Lord, that whatever situation a man is in, a woman's in at this time, but tonight we're focusing, we're focusing especially upon the men, Lord, because we will cover the whole family at the end, we pray. In part four, I do pray, Lord, that the men would step up in their lives and that, Lord, that they would treat each day like it's their last and that they would be gentle and loving and that they will serve. So, Lord, we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, the eternal God who has eternal love and power. Let us not allow the devil to destroy us or discourage us, but let us always find happiness in you, is my prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listeners, if you have any questions or if you'd like more information, please send an email to inquiries at wildernesspublications.org. You can send a text message to 07944 Zero six two, seven eight six. If you have the Android app for Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio, go to the ebook section and find the title "Bible Readings for the Home." Between chapters one hundred and sixty-six to one hundred and seventy-two, you will find more information about the subject, the restoration of the family unit. These chapters will give you more information about today's topic. You can also listen to and download our radio show podcasts at https colon forward slash forward slash voice dash in dash that's i n dash z that's t h e dash wilderness dot podcast page dot i o forward slash. If you would like to support Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio financially then please send your donation through our website at vitwradio.org. Click on the page called About Us. You can donate to us there. On next week's program, we will discuss womanhood. Well, that's it for tonight. Good night, listeners, and God bless. Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. It's not just knowing about the doctrine in the Bible. That is not what we stand for here. Streaming powerful, biblically-based messages. This congregation may never be gathered together again as we see it. Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week.